Now, when I say quantum to you, I think, you probably think the same as I think, I think of Albert Einstein, maybe if I've read some of the stuff, you'll know that despite Albert Einstein's observation of the photoelectric effect in the early 1900s being pivotal to the origins of quantum science, quantum mechanics, he, for the rest of his life, struggled with its implications. And he said things like that God does not play dice with nature. And so he had big doubts about that. Now, what I'm going to say is not going to try and answer Einstein's question. I'm just going to show you some examples of what quantum mechanics can do. And in particular, I'm going to try and explain in the course of the next few minutes, if I can read my timer here, um, what it is that quantum mechanics can do to make cameras that no classical technology ever can. OK, so special cameras. Now, what we did learn from Einstein is that light, as well as being a wave, is also a particle. And it's that particular property of light that I'm going to talk about now that's going to enable us to do things. And these particles of light are called photons. And as I look around the room, my eye is probably receiving something of the order of a million, million photons every second. Now, the question is, how many photons does your camera need to take a picture? Uh, I left my iPhone in there, so I wasn't tempted to tweet with it while I was talking to you. But if I was to pick up my iPhone and take a picture with it, that would, roughly speaking, be about the answer. It would be 10,000 million photons would be captured by my iPhone to take an image of the room here in front of me. But what about the camera that we have? Our camera uses one photon per pixel. So that's, I can assure you, a lot less light. Somewhere of the region of a million times less light. So let's think about how that happens. Well, if I take an ultraviolet laser, I can see out of my ultraviolet laser are coming those sort of blue photons in from the top. They enter this crystal. It's a little bit like a crystal of quartz. It's not quartz, it's something similar. And out of the other end come not one photon, but two photons. One of those photons is in the infrared. In fact, it's the same wavelength of the light that is the fiber communication system in your uh, fiber optic cable that brings you the internet. About 1.5 microns. That's a wavelength that's twice as long as anything you can see. And the other photon is in the blue. And so that's essentially a source of photon pairs coming out like Noah's Ark, the animals, two by two. Now, if I look at that really carefully, something very special happens. Both of the photons that come out of the crystal start off in exactly the same place. And so that means when I look at the crystal, I see the photons two by two. But the important thing is that within the beam, the large beam, the large crystal, those photons are in exactly the same position. The infrared and the blue photons are exactly the same. They then out come out the crystal and they sort of head off in different directions. But the note there that the patterns of the infrared and the pattern of the blue is exactly the same. So what do I do now? I put my object in one arm and my camera in the other arm. Now, remember, my object is illuminated by light in the infrared, but my camera sees the light in the visible. Now, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, there's a picture inside of our lab, and I could say that those two photons had been generated right at the top there, and this is the camera over here, and the object is over here. And I won't describe the detail, simply to say it's hard. But that's OK, because here's Ruben, and here's Peter. Peter's a PhD student, Ruben's a postdoc. And they worked for about two years to put this system together. And here, the image that's formed is an image, I'll run it again, from the camera of those visible photons arriving one by one by one. So every spot of light you see there is a single photon. Bearing in mind that I'm seeing that in the visible, but the object never saw those photons at all. 
the object only saw the infrared photons. And so I have infrared illumination that gives me a visible image. And rather than using a million billion photons or whatever that your iPhone uses, I am using, in this case, about 10,000 photons to form an image of this object. Why is it a ghostly image? Well, because it sort of resonates with Einstein's spooky action at a distance and the idea that actually I'm using light here that never saw the object. It just went straight to the camera. Now, the question I ask you, leaving quantum mechanics aside, if you could image things using only a handful of photons, what possible applications do you think that might have? Let's discuss later. Now, let me just keep going with this theme. What you can do with one photon per pixel, or well, what happens if you only have one pixel? My iPhone has about 8 million pixels in it, and that's pretty good. You maybe have some better camera than that that has 25 million pixels. Here we have a Canon 5D Mark III for the aficionados amongst you. It has 23 million pixels, and it must be brilliant. So how many pixels does our camera have? Oh, it has just one. Just one single pixel. Oh dear, that must be a really bad camera. Well, let's have a look at some of the images it produces. Well, there's a video taken with our single pixel camera. OK, it's not the greatest video on Earth, but it, it's not bad for one pixel. How does that work? Well, it actually works in the same way that a data projector works. We've got a data projector up there. It's projecting, look at those little sort of chessboard-like patterns. And this one pixel looks through the world at the, through the chessboard, through the crossword puzzle. And it, all it really knows is how many white squares overlap with the bright bits. Is it one white square that overlaps? Is it two white squares? Is it 27 white squares? It's a bit like playing that game Battleships, you know, H7, it's a hit, or, or whatever. And it does 20,000 patterns every single second. And it has 20,000 different answers as to how many white squares. And then the computer sits there, calculates what the image must have been to give those signals. And that's our image. Now, why do it? Why not just use your Canon camera or your iPhone camera? Well, you're going to see, do you see that flicking, that black screen came across? Now it's gone to black and white. Well, that's because it's seeing, not in the visible, but in the shortwave infrared. I'm going backwards and forwards now. That's like a heavily tinted window glass. But you see in the infrared, you can see straight through it. And our infrared detector costs a few tens of pounds. And so for the price of a data projector, effectively, plus a few tens of pounds for the infrared detector, I now make myself an infrared camera. Here's an image of what you can do with an infrared camera. This is the camera here. This is squirting some methane gas from your cooker. Okay, you can't normally see methane gas, but if you illuminate it at 1.654 microns, you can. And so we are here, are looking at the methane gas seeping out the end of that pipe. So the question, if you could build a really cheap camera that can see invisible gas, what would you do with that? Now, Quantum mechanics is complicated. We don't really understand how it works. There's some famous quotes which people go, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you're wrong. Okay? So we don't perhaps understand all its nuances. Therefore, how do I go about engaging? We've got this 30 million pound quantum technology hub. We're making all these things. We didn't get the money for nothing. We're there to engage with UK industry to link up with them and find solutions that solve real-world problems. So, that's me, and that's Einstein. Uh, rather than arguing with him about quantum mechanics, perhaps I'll just ask him the question, what would you do if you had a camera that dot, 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 did something? See what comes back. Now, in that sense, I'm going to say that engagement, people talk about it a lot about public understanding or public engagement, but engagement is a two-way process. 
It's not about telling. It's about asking. And then, who do we ask? Well, here we have, that's our little camera. You see that? This is at the Science Centre. That's Sun. That's Matt, two people in my group. This kind of question, what would you do if you could build a camera that looks around corners? That's what our colleagues in Harriet Watt are doing. Everyone can engage with that question, from my daughter who's 11, to the company, to all of you would have an idea. And you know what? I can absolutely guarantee that most of the ideas that you tell me, I will not have thought about. And so it's a great learning experience. And I go, oh, that's interesting. You'd do that, would you? I was talking about some of these cameras down at the Royal Society. And somebody said, that's brilliant, because it means we could actually look through the leaves of a cauliflower and see if our cauliflower is ripe, instead of having to unpeel it. Gosh. Oh, well, I can assure you I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> so you can ask the companies. That's Graham Malcolm from M Squared Lasers. Fantastic company that uh, employs about 100 people up on the Science Park. And perhaps, most importantly of all, here we go. This is, this is the principal's office, for anyone who hasn't seen inside our principal's office. And we set up our camera there. He handed it over to us for the day because Joe Johnson was coming up from Westminster to have a look at our hub. And again, it's the same thing. Not to try and lecture on how quantum mechanics works, but to articulate with people. If you had that capability, what would you do with that? If I could look through this material and see what's behind it, what would you do with that capability? How could we use that? If I could look at something using incredibly small amounts of light, so low in fact that you've got no chance of exposing a photographic film, what would I do with that degree of sensitivity? So the key is that I now, after this, want to listen to your answers, and then I'll know what we will do next. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that you've had a little insight into how we here in Quantic are going to set about imaging the future. If you want to know more about what we do, you can have a look at our website, of course. So thank you very much indeed.